Hello. Today I want to talk about some of the ideas of the liberal French aristocrat, the Marquis de Condorcet. I have briefly discussed his life and that of his wife, Sophie de Gouchy, in other videos and will summarize his views on women's rights and the idea of progress elsewhere. Condorcet has often been referred to as the last of the great French 18th century philosophes, but he was also an early exponent of what we now call the social sciences, as well as a prominent and passionate proponent of social and political reform, holding in this latter role views which even today would be regarded as fairly radical. Originally a shy mathematician, Condorcet's interests turned in the direction of social reformism in the 1770s after he had entered the political world under Togo's tutelage, and from the 1780s onwards he increasingly devoted himself to matters which he thought promoted the public good. An effective writer, he became a public advocate of change, as well as the biographer of the reformist figures of Voltaire and Turgot. His marriage to Sophie de Grouchy in 1786 reinforced these tendencies, the couple sharing a commitment both to social reformism and intellectual analysis. With the onset of the revolution in 1789, the Condorcets became energetic promoters of the new regime. Condorcet himself becoming a major public voice in the early reformist stage of the revolution, publishing actively, helping to draft the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and drafting many bills for the National Assembly. A sympathizer with both the newly established American Republic and the English radical Tom Paine, Condorcet and his wife became convinced Republicans, although initially willing to have a purely figurehead monarch. Perhaps the only major contributor to the famous encyclopedia to live long enough to participate in the revolution, he was a very visible bridge between the old world of philosophical advocacy and the new world of revolutionary action. Ironically, he was also one of the most prominent victims of the revolution. The Condorcets were perhaps archetypal liberals, committed to secular values and wanting to use educational, judicial and constitutional reforms to create a liberal, rational and democratic polity, but at the same time rejecting the extremism and what they saw as dictatorial policies of the Jacobins. From the 1770s onwards, Condorcet was concerned with a wide range of issues. One of the earliest was with economic policy, and as Turgot's protégé, he served as Inspector General of the Mint from 1775 to 1776. Inspired by both Turgot and the physiocrats, Condorcet supported such measures as the free trade in grain within France, the abolition of the old guilds and corporations, the suppression of the forced labor system of the corvée, so strongly associated with seigneurial rights and royal privilege, the reform of weights and measures, uh, and the freedom of commerce. He also supported Turgot's proposal to introduce a hierarchy of administrative assemblies from local to national level, and later developed his own ideas about the development of political justice through the ballot and constitutional revision in his essay on the Constitution and Functions of Provincial Assemblies. He also published sympathetic essays on the American Revolution and Constitutional Convention. He was an early advocate for the rights of religious minorities and was greatly influenced by Voltaire on this matter, albeit shocking him with his stridency. He opposed all religious intolerance and later publicly promoted the principle of toleration. This concern was later embodied in his proposals for educational reform, wherein he decried the former religious control of French education. Religious views were a matter of personal conscience and should not be governed by the state. Religious instruction should be excluded from public schools. Religious opinions could not form part of common instruction, he felt, since they had to be the choice of individual conscience, and no authority had the right to prefer one over the other. 
another area of concern was colonial reform and the abolition of the slave trade, notably in his 1781 Reflections on Black Slavery, which helped inspire the French abolitionist movement and the formation, early in 1788, of the Society of the Friends of the Blacks, of which Condorcet became the president in January 1789. Although never as important as the abolitionist society in Britain, which I've mentioned in other videos, this served as an important counter-lobby to the influential pro-planter Club Massiac. He also became one of the very few voices in French public life calling for equal rights for women. Again, he became one of the major proponents of a new national education system. He also advocated reform of criminal law, including the decriminalization of suicide and sodomy on the grounds that such behaviors did not violate the rights of others. And in a memoir on hospitals in 1786, he called for the closing down of the thousand-year-old Paris Municipal Hospital and replacing it with non-religious neighborhood hospices. Much of this effort was at the level of public advocacy, and despite his prominence in revolutionary politics, Condorcet repeatedly failed to get the various measures he proposed accepted. We can judge him to have been an unsuccessful politician. Finally, forced into hiding by his political opponents and in danger of arrest and execution, he composed his famous esquisse, a sketch for a historical picture of the progress of the human spirit, in which, in addition to describing what he saw as the stages of human progress already accomplished, he added a final chapter outlining his dreams for a future and better world. Turning to what we would now think of as social theory, Condorcet entered into the debate on human nature, which had taken form in the 17th century in Hobbes's critique of the view held by Grotius and others that human selfishness was balanced by human sociability. Here, like Turgot, Condorcet rejected naked self-interest as the only motivator of human behavior, as well as Helvetius's unmodified utilitarianism. For Condorcet, love and sympathy also played a role in developing human nature, a commitment to the importance of sentiment shared by his wife in her famous Letters on Sympathy. Thus, he held that when we became aware of the pain suffered by others, we want to be just and virtuous. Condorcet br brought this credo into his own life practice, seeking to preserve this awareness within himself after he had realized it, even giving up hunting, which he had previously enjoyed, and only killing insects if they were harmful. This sensibility also formed part of his final testament of 1794, in which Condorcet wrote to his infant daughter at a time when he knew that his own life was in danger. In this he advised her to find guidance in the writings of her mother and of himself. She should not let resentment overwhelm the soul's natural disposition to sympathize with others. Natural feelings made us share the sorrow of all sentient beings, and these must be preserved as a base for gentle sensitivity and as a source of happiness. Habitual cruelty produced a hardness of heart, and even cruelty towards animals could brutalize the original goodness of human nature. He also asked that her guardians bring her up to love freedom and equality and republican virtues. She herself should ensure that feelings of equality and justice became second nature to her. She should not harbor any feelings of personal vengefulness about what had happened to her parents. This credo also contributed to his views on education in which he rejected both humiliation of children by teachers and corporal punishment. Finally, let me turn to Condorcet's views about the social sciences in general and his application of mathematics to social science. As I've noted in the video on his life, Condorcet was a brilliant mathematician, an early paper on differential calculus gaining him election to the Academy of Sciences at the youthful age of 26. 
It was not surprising, therefore, that one of his earliest forays into what we would now think of as the social sciences was the application of statistical thinking to social and political affairs. A major product of this study was his 1785 essay on the application of analysis to the probability of majority decisions. This was a pioneering study of the way in which the calculus of probability could be applied to decision-making processes, as in the decisions of courts and legislative assemblies and in general processes of election. This was no mere academic study, as he wished to determine, for example, whether some electoral systems were more representative of the wishes of the electorate than others, and how likely it was that fair decisions would be made. Condorcet's analysis was highly mathematical, and so had little practical impact at the time, but has since become of major importance, both in discussions of how electoral systems work and of the importance of group decision-making processes in economics. Here we may particularly note what has become known as the Condorcet method, which can be both applied directly in an electoral system using proportional representation and can help us analyze voting decisions within and for a decision-making body. Thus, if there are three candidates for election or three possible measures to be voted for, a proportional voting system will normally determine the winner after taking account of second and third choices as well. If there's no clear winner emerging, then we have what is called the Condorcet paradox. If we have a non-proportional voting system, however, there is likely to be what is now called tactical voting, where voters who believe that their preferred candidate or measure has no chance of winning may vote instead for whichever of the rival candidates or measures is least offensive to them, so as to vote against a third or fourth alternative. Thus, for example, in modern-day Britain, with a first-past-the-post voting system, supporters of third parties may well decide that a vote for their own party will be a waste, and therefore vote instead for whichever of the big two parties they dislike least. In relationship to this study, Condorcet distinguished between two types of probability. Firstly, abstract probability, as in throwing dice, or in nature, and secondly, subjective probability, as with human decision-making. Both kinds of probability were parts of the same process and could be analyzed mathematically, but what he termed the grounds for belief were less with subjective probability than with abstract probability. His other statistical interests anticipated the great 19th century statistician Adolphe Quetelet, Thus, Condorcet wanted to study the composition of the population in terms of age, sex, and occupation, and to determine the causes and effects of changes in population, particularly the death rate. He also noted that factors such as sex, temperature, climate, profession, government, and ordinary habits all had a relationship to the duration of life. Again, as a mathematician, Condorcet presented a discourse to the French Academy in which he distinguished between the social sciences, at that time referred to as the moral sciences, and the natural sciences. If they were to be like the natural sciences and based on facts, then the moral sciences had to follow the same methodology, acquire a precise vocabulary, and achieve equal certitude. Thus, we could envisage a non-human researcher who would be able to study humans as dispassionately as we study bees or beavers. In reality, of course, human observers were part of what they observed, and truth could be no more judged by those who were prejudiced than by those who were corrupt. This was a major difficulty, and explained why the moral sciences had progressed so much slower than the physical sciences. Thank you for listening. In the next two videos, I will talk about Condorcet's ideas about the rights of women and the idea of progress.